Okay, and I am recording this, just to let everyone know that it is being recorded, as, as Wendy mentioned. Um, hi, like Wendy said, I'm Marjorie Rawhouse from Anne Arundel Community College. And uh, before I was an assistant dean, I was an engineering faculty member, and so I still teach part-time for both engineering and our student success department. So I want to kind of give you some tips on using Zoom in your classes. And I'm going to kind of run this the way I run my classes. I've kind of developed a class rhythm that I think kind of works, and I'm going to try to run it that way and give you guys some tips. So I usually start with a beginning slide like you saw when you came into the room. And I kind of mix it up. I try to make it look like a chalkboard or a whiteboard, or sometimes I just have a cartoon. But, I, but that's what I have on, on my screen um, as the students are coming into the classroom before class starts. I usually have a waiting room because I want to make sure that I can kind of make sure I'm set up before the students can log into the meeting. I usually have not in the past used a password because I'm worried that all the students will be trying to find the password and not be able to get into this class. Although I may consider changing that when I teach later this month because I know we've had some, um, a few people that have gotten Zoom bombed. So, but that's how I've done it in the past. Um, so I usually start my class with a poll. And I do wanna say that this is primarily about the tools for Zoom. It's not so much about how to engage students, although the two kind of go hand in hand, knowing how to use the tools can maybe help you do some better class engagement. And so I'm gonna put up a couple of polls and this is usually just a way to get the students engaged or to um, basically uh, assess prior knowledge. So there's gonna be two polls. So you should see a poll when I launch the poll. Let's see. And so hopefully you now see the poll and just go ahead and respond. I'll give you a few, few seconds to respond here. Um, I see no one is voting. So are you not seeing it? Okay, there we oh, go. Oh, we see it. Okay, got it. Yeah, I see it. Took a while to see responses. And I'll show you later how to set up these polls. You can do them on the fly and you can also set them up ahead of time so that they're ready to go. So um, I'll give you another few seconds. A few people haven't voted yet, but that's okay. I'll give you a few more seconds and if not, we'll just end the poll. All right. All right, so here's the responses if you wanna kind of see what things people have done. Um, I can see people have used polls, breakout rooms, a little bit of video filters. No one's using the whiteboard. It's okay, everyone's done screen sharing it looks like. Um, okay, great. Um, yeah, Kathleen says she can never get the second poll set up when you do it uh, on the fly. So it's better to plan ahead. Uh, that might be true, I don't know if I've tried that. Um, I'll stop sharing the results now and I have another poll. I think that's gonna work, let's see. All right, so here's my second poll. And here I can share results. So you can see most people are attending meetings, some are hosting meetings and uh, one person is teaching classes. So hopefully after this, you'll feel a little more comfortable to host meetings and teach classes using Zoom. One thing I'll say is that if you do polls, there is, um, oh yeah, some people maybe are doing more than one. I did say primarily, so I probably could have had that be more than one, but thanks for that comment. Um, that you can relaunch the poll but I just wanna warn you that if you relaunch a poll, all the previous poll results disappear. So you can't relaunch the poll to let extra people vote who haven't already voted unless you want everyone to vote again. So that's just a little tip about polls. So again, I kind of, this is kind of what I do with my class with my start with the poll after the opening slide. Then I might talk about the uh, class a little bit, maybe do some screen sharing. So right now I'm gonna talk about something you probably already know, but just to reinforce it, how to switch between your gallery view and your speaker view not just on your laptop or your computer, which most of us probably use, but also our students might be using other devices. So if you right now see the Brady Bunch view, which right now is a bunch of names instead of a bunch of pictures, that's the gallery view. Um, if you're on a laptop, up in the corner, you'll see something that says speaker view. If you switch to speaker view, you'll probably see me giant on your screen because I'm the speaker. 
So it will automatically sense who's speaking and it'll switch to that person's video. Now keep in mind, if you're in a meeting and anyone who has it on speaker view is seeing the speaker, if your microphone is not muted and you cough, anybody on speaker view will suddenly see you for a second after you coughed. So just keep in mind that whatever you're doing, you may inadvertently be um, giant on someone's screen if you're, if you're not muted. If you're using a phone or a tablet, it's a little bit different. If you're on an iPad or a tablet, you probably have to tap or double tap, and then those controls will appear on the left-hand side of your screen. If you switch from speaker view to ga um, from gallery view to speaker view, then you'll see a little grid that says gallery view, and you can switch back and forth. On a phone, if you're on an iPhone or a, an Android phone, the students can swipe left and right to go between speaker view and gallery view, and they can also when you're in speaker view, you can double tap on the person you want to see speaking. I'm also going to talk about um, pinning videos. This is really handy, especially for a couple of reasons. Um, one thing it's handy for is if you have a, a um, ASL interpreter in your meeting or your class and the students who want to see that ASL interpreter, they can pin that video. And on a computer, it's very easy if you want to pin someone and just I'd ask you to just kind of try it now, pick the person you want to pin or pin me. When you scroll over the person's name or face, you'll see three little dots. If you click the three little dots, which we by now should know that that means there's more options coming up available, you should see pin video as one of your options. If you click pin video, it will pin that person's video to be the giant video on your screen. And then you'll see somewhere on that, on that giant screen, there'll be an unpinned video option. So that's something that you can do. Um, on a on a phone, um, I think that you have to go into the participants list to pin a video. So if someone's on a phone or a tablet, they can go to the participants list, select that person from the list, and one of the options there will be pin video. This is also handy to use in a class. Say you're in a speech class or an acting class, and you want two students um, to work with each other. Uh, say that you're you're all going to recite a poem together, but you want but you want the students to watch a particular student, they can pin each other. I've done this in virtual choir practice and, um, and uh, where we've pinned, we're, we're all muted, but we're singing, we're pinning each other so we can watch each other sing. Someone said that, they, that all the three dots all they saw were um, chat and hide non-video participant. Oh, no, okay, she's got it, good. Um, so those are some things you can do. Another thing I'm gonna show you under uh, which you can also also see, let me get back to gallery view here, is if you go into participants and you look at your name, you should see an option to raise your hand. If you're on a phone or a tablet, you might see that that option just when you click on participants without even having to click your name. So that they're also, so you can raise your hand. You can have your students raise their hands in class if they want to ask a question or if you don't want to have them like um, doing the chat box because it, it can be challenging to try to monitor the chat while you're trying to um, engage your class. So that's something that you can notice. So we did pin video. Another thing you might wanna let your class know about or that you might wanna start using in meetings if you wanna look really cool are the reactions. And some of you may have used these before. But if you look, if you're on a laptop or a PC, probably at the bottom somewhere in your controls, you see a reactions button. It's like, yes, Elizabeth sees it, she's giving me a thumbs up. It's a little smiley face. Um, you'll see the reactions there. You have an option of a thumbs up. You have an option of um, some confetti. If you're really happy, you have a surprise reaction. So uh, that's another thing you can use in your class. You can say, hey, give me a thumbs up if you understand what I'm saying, or give me a thumbs up if you, if you got the material. Or, you know, this is supposed to be hands clapping. So if you're really happy about something, people can clap their hands. Again, I think if you're on a laptop, I'm, I'm sorry, if you're on a PC or a tablet or an iPad, that shows up when you look at the participant screen. If you're on a desktop or a PC, that shows up on your control bar um, as a reaction. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about screen sharing. And I try to show at least one little video in my class that has something to do with the class. And so I'm gonna show you a little video about screen sharing. I wanna point out a few things I want you to notice um, in the video. Um, first of all, notice I talk about um, sharing sound that's really important if you're sharing something that has sound associated with it, because you will hear the sound coming out of your computer, but your, your class will not hear it unless you actually share sound. 
they don't mention this, but they do mention the advanced settings. And one of the advanced settings is to share the sound only. Suppose you want to listen to a piece of music in a music class, and it doesn't have really a video associated with it. And so you want the students to just be listening to it, but not necessarily watching it. You can share sound only. Also notice that when, and you'll see this in the video, once you share your screen, your controls move. They used to be on the bottom. Now they move either to the top, or if you have a second monitor, they might move to the second monitor. So I've been in situations where I've had one of those um, little mini brain freak outs, but all of a sudden I can't find my controls because I'm sharing my screen and they move. So just be prepared for that the first time you share your screen that your controls are gonna be now be somewhere else. All right, so let me um, end my slideshow here and I'll share this video with you. video, you'll learn how to share content within a Zoom meeting. Simply select Share Screen at the bottom of your meeting window to get started. From here, you'll be given various options for sharing, such as sharing your full desktop or an individual application you have open on your computer. You can also access advanced sharing options and the ability to share an individual file from a specific location as well. If you're planning to share content that contains audio, such as a third party video, be sure to select share computer sound in the bottom left hand corner to ensure that your participants can hear your computer sound as you're sharing. When you're ready, select share on the right hand side. Once content sharing begins, you can always stop the share to stop sharing content with others at any time. If you need to pause the share to take a momentary break or prepare other materials, this is an option as well. Or if you'd like to share a new piece of content, you can simply select new share and select another piece of content for a seamless transition. Okay, so that was the kind of basics of sharing your screen. You'll notice that there's some choices. You can share the whole screen, just the application, just the file. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each one of those. And if you want more information about that, there are lots of things online that talk about it. But I would suggest that maybe you, um, if you're interested, have a meeting with yourself or with your spouse or one of your friends and just kind of experiment with that and see how it works out. One thing I will tell you, I wasn't sure of this, so I tried it. If you are sharing your whole screen, they will not see your Zoom controls because I was worried that if I had this showing the screen and then I have like the Zoom controls or the chat box open, they don't see that. They just see everything else on your screen. So that's something that you want to keep in mind. So now we're going to look at breakout rooms and I'm sure some of you have been in breakout rooms before. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just do breakout rooms on the fly and I think there are 18 people here. So I'm going to go ahead and um, divide you into, I think I'm going to do five breakout rooms and I'm going to divide you automatically just so you can see kind of what it's like to go into breakout rooms. Um, I'm going to send you a message while you're in the breakout room and then you're also going to see uh, the one minute warning come up that I'm going to send you. So what I want you to do, I'm only going to give you a few minutes, introduce yourself, maybe tell people what school you're from and maybe one thing you want to accomplish uh, this semester related to your teaching, related to your job, related to your personal life, just one thing you have a goal for this semester. So you should see, um, I just said, uh, when I say create rooms, you'll see a little button that allows you to go to the room.
Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Okay, people Interesting that right. it automatically muted when we when I came back in. I wonder if that's the same for everyone. Oh, I don't. I think it did. I don't know if that's a setting I have or if that's just what it does automatically. Um, once the once the breakout rooms close, everyone will automatically be thrown back into the main room if you haven't already left the breakout room. So, welcome back, everyone. Good to see some of you. Um, So I did send you a little broadcast message while you were in there. Uh, one warning I'll warn you is that that broadcast message has a limited number of characters. I don't know what the limit is, but I know from personal experience, it's not enough to send a list of five questions you want them to consider in the breakout room because I tried that early in my class and realized it wasn't gonna work. So um, it's limited to just you know a sentence or two that you can send them. What I usually do is if I want them to consider things in the breakout room, I will try to send them ahead of time or post them on Canvas so that the students, when they're in the breakout room, can either have it in front of them because they've already printed it or they can have it available in Canvas and one of them can bring up Canvas and look at it. So that's something to, to think about. I'm gonna show you now how to set up um, polls and breakout rooms. And the one thing you have to do is you have to go into your account and you have to enable um, polls and breakout rooms both. And I'm going to share my screen again. And I think, let's see. I'm going to share, share screen two. Okay. So hopefully you're now seeing my Zoom. Um, oh, you're probably not seeing my Zoom controls because you can't see the Zoom controls, but no, never mind. Um, if you can see my Zoom controls, you would see that, that one of the options I have on my controls at the bottom, I have polls and I have breakout rooms as options along the bottom of my, of my screen. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, do a share of my other monitor. Um, to set up polls and breakout rooms ahead of time, go into your actual Zoom account at zoom.us and log in. And then you'll see under meetings, for example, I had this development team meeting this afternoon. If I select that meeting, you can see at the bottom, I have no polls created for this meeting. If I want to add a poll, I just click the add poll button, uh, enter the title, type the question, make a single or multiple choice, and then save it. And then when you go into your meeting tonight, that poll will be there. I usually make the polls anonymous. Uh, for my students, you don't have to. If you want to see how people answered, you can, and you can save the results, but I usually make them anonymous. So that's how you can add a poll um, ahead of time to your class. As far as breakout rooms, where it says edit this meeting, uh, somewhere there's a choice. Down here it says breakout rooms pre-assign. So what you can do is you can uh, I have never imported my list of breakout rooms. I always create them from scratch. So you can um, add rooms and you can rename them, whatever you want to rename them. I'll call this one the, uh, this is the 
data team. Oops. Just open something I didn't mean to open. Sorry. Um, there's the data team. Uh, there's the there's the com. You can just call them breakout room one and two if you want to. I'd like to give my name so that it makes sense. There's the com team. You'll see you can also you can also add participants ahead of time. The rooms, I guess I must have not, I'm sorry, I must have not saved it. That's what happens to you during your class. Let's just do a couple of breakout rooms, one and two. Okay, and let's save them. So now if I log into that meeting, then I'll have two breakout rooms. You can also add participants ahead of time if you have their email addresses. I have not usually done this because I'm never sure that people are going to join with the email address that I have for them. But you can add the participants ahead of time as well, and then they'll be automatically joined into your, into your breakout room. This is really handy if you happen to have your Zoom account linked with your LMS, which I think if you have an institutional account, you probably do. I'm using my personal account, so I don't have mine linked, so I'm just doing everything in my Zoom account. You can also do breakout rooms on the fly. Once you have breakout rooms enabled in your class, you can, or in your account, um, you can just click the breakout rooms tab. And what I did was I just basically clicked um, automatically create how many rooms I wanted, it automatically assigns people. You can also create the rooms ahead of time. You can create the rooms on the fly manually and assign people as you go. You'll also see that there's a chance to move people around from different rooms. So, so it's relatively easy. It's pretty self, it's pretty self-evident once you um, once you've done it. But you do need to go into your account ahead of time, not not the Zoom app itself, but your actual Zoom account at zoom.us where you have to log in that's where you actually can make the changes to your account to do things like enable polling, enable breakout rooms, and, and those kind of things. Uh, one thing I will warn you, see I'm still screwed up. I will warn you that uh, if you have breakout rooms assigned, and I know this from experience, and you have people in the waiting room and you think, oh, this is great, I'll just assign them to the breakout rooms while they're in the waiting room before the meeting starts, and then we'll start the meeting. Um, I don't know why this is, but once they move from the break, the waiting room to the actual meeting, that breakout room assignment goes away. And I've heard other people say that as well, so I think it's not just me. Another thing I will say is that if you want the breakout rooms assigned ahead of time, you have to do it in your software. If you open the meeting and assign the breakout rooms in the meeting itself and then close the meeting, it does not save it. It has to be assigned in the actual meeting in your account. Again, not sure why that is, but just letting you know in case you might think you're going to try it and then you get to your class and you open it up and the breakout rooms are all gone. I do not want that to happen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some tips I have for using Zoom with your students, but anybody have any questions or thoughts so far? I see a few smiling faces. This is kind of like and, teaching and, class. And, I'm and, sorry. Uh, can students choose their breakout room? Um, you know what? Um, I th let me. I wonder if there's a way to do. Let me just let me see if there's a way to do that. If I sign it manually, um, I don't think they can. I think you can assign them, but there's no way for them to see the breakout rooms and choose which one to go into. But you could you could let them pick ahead of time, and then you could assign them based on what they pick. Is something you could do, like if you have different teams. That's a good question. I've not thought of that before. Um, I don't see any way you can do it. I, I would say that for all these things, this is just a quick, quick brush over. There are tons of videos and tutorials and articles online about how to use Zoom. Everybody is using Zoom like crazy, and so you can get all kinds of information. And again, um, I've used my sister and my husband as guinea pigs. I've also had a meeting with myself where I'm on my laptop and my phone and an iPad, um, trying to see how the different things work. So, uh, you know, I would say experiment ahead of time if you have time and just make sure you kind of know what, what's going to be going on when you when you um, release this onto your students. So. Does, does Zoom allow voting or do you use the reaction? I think you have to use the poll, maybe have a yes, no. I don't think there's a specific yes, no voting option, but I have never looked for one. But you can use a poll. 
I've also used a poll for attendance. Just I've had a poll where I say they select here or not here, you know, kind of a little bit of humor and hopefully they select here. Um, but then you have to have the poll not be anonymous to, to do that. Okay, um, I mentioned I kind of have a class rhythm I try to do with my class. I don't always stick exactly to it, but I try to start with a poll. I usually talk a little bit. I usually have a short video. And then I usually have um, some kind of a presentation that relates to the topic as well. And I usually make it pretty short. So I'm gonna show you a presentation that I developed for this class. And again, I'm gonna try to share my screen. And I'm calling this um, using Zoom with students and I have good practices. I wanted to call it best practices, but that would imply that I actually did research and figured out the best practices. These are really just things I've learned that I think are good practices and I'm sharing them with you. And the basics are a few things. Um, first of all, I would say use the same meeting link and ID for the entire course. I set up my course ahead of time and I, I make it a recurring meeting and I give it the name you know, STEM 213, section 002, fall 2020, or like, something like that. And then I think publish that link early and often. Email it to your students, put it in your syllabus, post it on the LMS, email it again, um, post an announcement again reminding them to make sure that they, have no, that they have no worries about finding out how to get onto your course. If you're using Zoom for a class that meets synchronously, have a clear and established attendance policy and publish it. Let students know whether these, whether these meetings are optional, um, whether they're expected attendance, let them know whether they're gonna be recorded, those kind of things. I would say also, if you're using this for a class, plan your time and practice using the technology. Even if you've taught the material a lot, sometimes the rhythm of a Zoom class is not quite the same as the rhythm of a face-to-face -face class. So you want to do at least a little bit of class prep so you kind of know what order you're going to teach things in, what you're going to show when, have your videos preloaded, those kind of things, and practice a little bit. Um, like with anything, if you use technology in your classroom, if you have a document camera, if you have a, a, you know, a camera that shows your computer, the students will be forgiving the first like three or four, maybe five times that you can't use it correctly. But um, if you've gone the whole semester and can't, still can't use the document camera correctly, uh, the students start to get a little, they, start, they kind of start to notice. So I'd recommend as best you can, now things will happen, as best you can, practice a little bit ahead of time to know what's going on. I would say encourage camera use and model the behavior that you want. Um, you guys are all doing what my students do. They come into class, as soon as they get there, they turn their camera off. Uh, we don't require students to use their cameras because we know that they might be uncomfortable and we'd rather have them come to class um, then not come to class because they don't want to use their camera. But I always try to encourage my students to put their camera on at least when they come in so they can say hi. Um, I always have my camera on during the class when I'm talking to them. And um, I really try to encourage them if we're meeting one-on-one -on -one, that I really need to have them, I need to be able to see them. It's just like a meeting in my office. Um, you want to come into my office and hold a thing, paper in front of your face when you talk to me. Um, again, I don't totally force it, but I try to kind of gently um, encourage it. Then I would say on day one, monitor your email during the class because there's gonna be at least one student who can't find the link or he, he clicked the wrong link because he clicked the link for his English class instead of his math class or something and he's gonna to wanna to know how to get in. So, so have, that, have that kind of up in another window and see if you can make sure students aren't lost. Um, I would include a brief tour of Zoom when the students first come into the first class. Go over at a minimum the chat, the reactions, the gallery versus speaker view, how to raise your hand, how to rename yourself, uh, which we didn't talk about, but um, we can talk about later, and how to mute and unmute. And also keep in mind that while most of us might be using computers or laptops, they might be using phones or tablets, and it looks a little different on the phone or the tablet. So when you're explaining things, uh, make sure that you can kind of explain how it happens on their devices or let them know that it might be different on their device. And if you, and if you can't figure it out, um, because it can be hard if you're on a PC and they're asking you questions and they're telling you what, telling you what they see. Um, at the minimum, tell them, hey, you know, look online. Just Google, how do I change my name on my iPhone Zoom call or something? And, and they'll probably find something that, that helps them out there. 
And I guess going forward, I say have a welcoming opening each class. I try to do that. Sometimes I play music. Sometimes I usually have a slide. Um, act like you know what you're doing, which I think we've all, if we're teachers, we've kind of learned this. Even when you're not sure what you're doing, you kind of have to like act like you know what you're doing because you actually do. And then um, usually finish with a chance to ask questions. And I usually, what I usually do as well is I stay after class a few minutes. If I have a, an hour and 15 minute class, the class itself might go about an hour or so. And then I'll say, I'll stay here for 15 more minutes and people can um, stay and ask questions or they can leave and come back in if they want to leave and come back in in those 15 minutes. So it's kind of like the equivalent of having the kids go up to you after class and ask questions. And I realize I shouldn't call my students kids, they're students. Most of my students are pretty young, so I apologize for that. Um, so that's, those are my thoughts on, uh, and just I'd like to say, you know, don't worry, you got this, like you do. It's, you can handle it. And that's all I have. And stop sharing. So those are my tips. Um, I'll talk briefly about a few other things, but before I do, uh, again, any questions you thought of or any ideas? If anyone is using Zoom for a class, I'd be interested to hear or have you put in the chat kind of what you found works. Um, I, I'm teaching and I find they really like the breakout rooms and the polls a lot because it's interactive. Um, so that's been working really well. What's frustrating is what we're all doing now to you, which is um, not showing the video. And so it's hard for me to know if they're really listening or not, if they're, um, and to be quite honest, I'm listening, but I have two monitors and I've got something up on my other monitor. Sure. <laughs> so um, what I've been doing is just having, like asking a question and going around the board and having each person answer, even if there's no video, just so they know, you know, that I'll be calling on you once in a while. Yes, and, that, and that's a good expectation to set at the beginning because I, again, I've had that happen. And it's funny because in my class I taught over the summer, um, as the semester went on, more and more students did not turn on their camera. I think it's kind of like in the beginning they did because they thought they were going to have to. Mm -hmm. And then as they saw that other students weren't, they said, oh, I'm not going to, going to either. Um, some of them would turn it on when they talk and then would turn it back off again. Um, and so you're right, you have to kind of keep on top of it. You can always tell when you do breakout rooms and there's one person who hasn't gone to the breakout room yet and then suddenly five minutes later, oh, they go to the breakout room. They clearly were not paying attention or were right. you know, getting a cup of coffee or something. And, and I understand that happens too. Again, I would rather have my students come to class in that mode than not come at all because they're afraid that I'll call them out about it. So I think it's a kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a fine, fine line to walk there. Right. Um, I have a question. Um, sure. When you break a uh, break room and the two students chat to each other, does the uh, instructor can hear their chat? You can't. Uh, okay. But what you can do is you can actually go into the other break rooms. When you have the break rooms um, on your screen after you open them, you'll uh -huh. see next to each one of them a button that says join. So you can kind of virtually move to that break room. And it's like popping into the break rooms if the students are in break rooms. You can pop in and out. So, so students that know you also can hear, right? Instructor can hear. Um, I don't think you can hear them if you're not in their room. Okay. I just want to because when students don't want to something, they talk, they don't want to teach it to hear. Right. So they may ask you, can you hear us no. or not? No. When they're in their break rooms, you cannot hear them unless you move to that break room. Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you. Sure. But you can travel to the break room if you just want to pop in and see what's going on. Gotcha. But that's, but that's a good question. Something to follow up on that, something a colleague told me, which I, which I just used yesterday, is I had been going into the breakout rooms. When I'm teaching, I'm always visible, my video's on. And a colleague said that the students are more likely to continue talking when you drop in their breakout room if you turn your video off, because um, they can't see you. And I did that yesterday, and I think it's true. I, I think it, even though um, you, can, you can hear them and you're there, they're not as aware of you as the ins instructor as if you're really listening in and they seem more comfortable. Yeah, that's actually a good point. I guess it's probably like the difference between standing in the back of the room and listening versus walking right up to the group, maybe kind of. So that's a good point. I hadn't thought about right. that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
Kathleen so. made a comment uh, about the bandwidth and audio can be better for some students without the camera. So if you set it up in a set up an advanced setting, there's a statistic that shows you if the participant minimized the Zoom to view other screens. Oh, I did not know that. I'll have to check that out. But that is a good point about the bandwidth. And that happens in meetings sometimes. If you're in a meeting and everybody has their video on and you're having trouble, like the, the sound is garbled or it's, it's buffering a lot, if you turn off your video, sometimes that will help because it does use less bandwidth. So that is a, that is a good point. Some students will do that. But I have to check out that advanced setting. That's some things I learned. I learned something new tonight. And I'm not really trying to spy on my students um, because if they're not paying attention, it's going to come out eventually. Like, you know, you're going to notice in their grades, you're going to notice in you know, other things if they're, if they're actually not paying attention. So I'm not totally trying to spy on them, but it is good to know that I could if I wanted to. Um, that's, that's an interesting, interesting um, comment. So thank you. Um, all right, I have we have some time. Let's see what time is it. So I think I will also show you a few things. I'm just going to show you some things about. Oh well, one thing I one thing I have um, I have done. I teach classes that are kind of more conceptual. I'm not I'm not teaching anymore electrical engineering or or physics where I have to do a lot of equations and show things. But um, a lot of my colleagues are using different things to do that. But one thing I discovered, kind of just by trying it, is you can use your webcam as a document camera if you want to. Um, so what, so I, what I've done before is I've just kind of like tilted my, uh, tilted my um, camera down so you can see my tablet and I write on it and I try to make it big enough that people can see it. And so if I'm writing the equations on the, oh, you can't, I'm not doing very well, a very good job. Um, but, but you can, you can line it up to be a document camera. Let me just see if I can make that up. Let me move you over to the, my other monitor so I can see what's happening. Let me go speak of you so I can see myself. Um, if you, line your if you line your document camera up just right, and if you you can you can write, and you, the students can see what you're writing. Now, one thing I'll warn you about: um, we're going to talk about video in a minute. The the default setting for the video is for you to be mirrored. So when you see yourself on the video, you think you're looking in a mirror, but when the other people see you, they see you the way they would see you if they looked at you. So um, when I raise my right hand, it looks to you like it's my right hand. Um, to me, it looks like I'm looking in the mirror. So if you're using a document camera and writing on your document, um, what you see on the screen will look backwards to you. But keep in mind that your students will see it forwards. If that bothers you, there is a way to go into your video settings and take away the mirror. And then, then when you see yourself, you'll see yourself how other people are seeing you. But it can be disconcerting to you because your right hand is in the wrong place from what you think of when you're looking in the mirror. So something to think about. Um, I'm going to show you a few things now about uh, video and some of these features unfortunately are only available on computers or the desktop app or only available if you have a really newer version of an iPhone or, or an, an iPad. Um, but some of you maybe have used backgrounds before. If you want to try it, if you're on a computer, you see your little stop video button, which I know you all know where it is because you all stopped your video. Um, there's a little arrow. And that will bring up either video settings or two choices on mine, choose virtual background or choose video filter. So if you, choose, if you pick choose virtual background, if you want to try it or if you just want to keep notes for the future, Zoom has some built-in backgrounds. Um, you can do outer space. Uh, you can do the Golden Gate Bridge. You can make your own backgrounds with my pictures here. Here's a picture I have of the Bay Bridge that I sometimes use um, if I'm meeting with someone who's not from Annapolis. So you can do all kinds of cool things with backgrounds. If your students know about this, they might be more willing to share their video if they know that you're not looking behind them at their dirty laundry or their kids or whatever, whatever else is going on. Um, on an iPhone or an iPad, I do know how to do this, but I have to look it up. Um, I, I think it's under participants again, but unfortunately it's only available if you have like an iPhone 8 or later or iPad Pro or some of the newer ones. And it's not available on the Android phone. So if, if you have an Android phone, they can't, they can't do backgrounds, unfortunately. Um, I'll just uh, get my background now. But if you do have a desktop monitor, if you want to try it with some people in a meeting, there's also a video filters version. Um, and what that lets you do is pick all kinds of cool filters. For example, 
Um, I had this problem where I always looked purple on Zoom and I tried to figure out my camera settings. I couldn't figure anything out. I finally replaced all the light bulbs in my office, both in my overhead light and my desk lamps with um, LED bulbs instead of incandescent bulbs. And that helped a lot. I don't look as purple anymore, but you can also experiment with different filters if you wanna, if you wanna be like a sepia tone, if you wanna be more brown. I found that if you use the, the kind of gray one, it makes you look a little bit more sunny. Um, you can also put yourself on television. If you want to talk from a television, if you want to have a frame around yourself, there's all kinds of little, um, uh, you can wear a hat, you can wear you know, sunglasses. So if you do have a desktop app, this is a kind of a cool thing you can do with people in a meeting if you just want to mix it up. Unfortunately, like I said, if your students don't have a desktop app, it's kind of hard for them to get to it. So it's not something you can really use really easily. And um, we didn't go over this at the beginning, I meant to, but there is a way that you can rename yourself, and I'm sure you guys know this, but if you're on the desktop app, the three dots around your picture, one of those versions is rename. So you can, if you want to have, um, if you're in a meeting with people from other schools, you want to have your school next to your name. If you're using someone else's software and it's got their name and you want it to be your name, if you want to just have your first name, you can do that. And students can do this as well on any, on any device. If you're not on the desktop, the rename option is again under the participants list. They think that they go to the participants list and next to their own name, they should see rename as an option. So they can do it on a phone or on an iPad. Um, so if you have a student that logs into your class and their, their name says like, um, you know, giggles one, two, three, you might ask them who they are so you know who they are for attendance and they may want to change that so that in your class they actually have their name there. If you change it in a meeting, it doesn't keep it, it won't save that as a default. If you want to save it as a default, you have to go into your account and actually change the name in your account so that it shows um, as the default. And I really think those are kind of um, enough basics to get you started, I think. Uh, again, as I mentioned, there, there's all kinds of videos and tutorials available online, both from Zoom and from people that are using Zoom. So there's plenty of information. One thing I've been meaning to do, and I hope it will get done before my class starts at the end of October, is to make a little handout for my students that helps them be able to find out how to do these things on their phone and their, and their um, tablets in terms of how do, you, how do you mute, how do you unmute, how do you, um, how do you switch from gallery view to... to uh, you know, a speaker view. Um, so I, I think that that kind of wraps it up and I'm happy to take any questions or again, if anyone has any comments, um, if you feel like I'm, I'm uh, showing your video briefly just so we can all see that we're all here. Although if you don't want to, that's okay. I totally get it. You know, your kitchen's a mess, whatever. I see Christine and Pam. Oh, Pam's in Disney World. Just say hi. Oh, thank you. You guys are great. This has been a lot of fun. This is really good. I did want to just um, note, because I don't know if um, Kathleen can unmute or not, but she also, she mentioned using the phone for the best audio quality. And we had another uh, presenter who did the same thing. She actually did it so that she could put the camera up because she liked the, the view better. And so she did that, but she also used her computer. But that's, um, for me, that would be hard. I'd have to figure out what to mute and what not to mute. But um, oh, <laughs> Pam, Pam's definitely got it down for the uh <laughs> for the crowd oh, oh yeah look at that Th that's a good point though um if you do if you do use your phone make sure that you're muted on your computer otherwise you get this this huge feedback and everyone will you'll break everyone's eardrums um that was a problem when i was trying to do when i was trying to log in three times with different devices i had to have them far enough apart so that if i unmuted one or the other i wasn't like killing myself but that is another option um yeah. The only, there was one other thing that when you showed your video, um, it, this is just one thing that I learned the hard way. It, it was very small because it was kind of equal with the um, screen. And so it's very easy. There's like a line yeah. when you shrink um, a cell in a table, you can just pull it. You can make the, whatever you're viewing. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Thank you. That's a good tip. Shrink those things. That's, that was the only thing that I was thinking of. Great. Well, again, I hope you guys are all ready to go and um, and uh, do great things in your classes. No other, no other questions. There's another. Someone else has something in the chat. Gary's <laughs> doing the TV. Uh, that's computer. awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's um, good. Yeah, she found the good. She found the filters. Yeah, that's great. great. And um, I don't have filters on mine. 
but I, I have, I can do the backgrounds, but I have to figure that out. I'm going to have to go in and find out why I don't have both. Just cause I wanna... Yeah. And I don't know, because I know, it, I know it says only if you're in the desktop app. So I think you have to be logged into your, you have to be actually logged in as opposed to just, I'm not sure. Um, and maybe that's what it is. And, and, and I know that I did find out that it's not available on a lot of the phones and, and tablets, unfortunately, which is what a lot of our students use. Because it would be kind of fun in your class if everybody put on a different hat or something. Um, oh, sure. sure. But it can be tough if they don't have, the, if they don't have all the stuff. Um, I'll say one thing in case any, I, I wasn't really part of my presentation, but you may, have, you may wonder about it later. I mentioned if you have an ASL interpreter that the students can, the students can pin that person. Um, there is not an automatic captioning that I know of in Zoom, but you can assign a captioner if you're the host of the meeting or the class. And so if you have students who need that and you have someone who is a captioner because you have to be able to, you know, not anyone can just keep typing while people are talking, um, you can go in and assign that person to the, be the captioner and they will get a pop-up box that they can type the captions in as you're talking. Um, but if you do have students or, or people that you need to make sure that you have accommodated, you know, obviously you talk to your, your Office of Disability Support at your, at your school, they can help you out with that. But that is a feature in Zoom. Well, this has been very informative. Um, if you have any questions at all, you know, type them in or, or unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, we'll wrap up. I, should, I forgot to mention that Marjorie is also a graduate of our Maryland Online Leadership Institute. Um, and I'm very appreciative that she was willing to volunteer to do this today because I think Zoom has become so prevalent in all of our lives, whether we like it or not, that um, I know that I wrote notes down. I'm actually going to be using the breakout rooms for the first time in, uh, I'm going to try it in a couple of days. So, um, so very excited to hear all the news. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm glad everybody came. I'm glad you can make it. And I hope that, I hope you learned at least one thing. Yeah. Great. Well, Thank you so much. And Marjorie, I'm going to, say, as host, I'm going to have you end the meeting. <laughs> okay. Oh, do you want me to give it back to you or just end? I can just end. Yeah, I don't think I can. I don't Thank you. Can. Oh, yes. Thanks a lot. Let me stop recording. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, stop recording.